You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by the National Association of Convenience Stores. Welcome once again. This is Jeff Leonard with the National Association of Convenience Stores and joined by my regular co-host. I'm John Eichberger with NAX and the Fuels Institute. We're going to talk to you about fuels, convenience stores, stuff we sell inside, outside, everything that fuels you, basically convenience stores provide to keep you on the road. And we aren't going to specifically be talking about fuels today, but we're going to be talking about something that's very important to convenience stores and those who also sell fuel. And and that's how do you responsibly sell in your community, specifically with age-restricted products. And we're joined today, uh, we're lucky enough to have our guest today, uh, Doug, Doug Anderson, who is president of the We Card program. So welcome, Doug. Great. Thanks for having me here. And WeCard is probably one of the most recognized logos that that anybody will see. You see that on virtually, how many convenience stores have these stickers and and what what is the sticker supposed to tell or the door clings, whatever is the preferred terminology, what what does that tell people? It is iconic, and it is everywhere from coast to coast. I've seen it on Nantucket all the way out to Catalina Island off the coast of California, so it is it is everywhere. It's meant to uh, embody uh, a store's, not only its policy, but a national effort by everyone who sells age-restricted products, particularly tobacco and the, and the e-cigarettes and the vaping community, that we are responsible, that we ask for ID. And it uses that common phrase, card, we card. I think it's a critical element, especially for the convenience industry, Jeff. Tobacco products still represent, what, 35 40% of our in-store sales? And this is a big category in making sure that we are doing the right thing to make sure that the tobacco products and associated products we're selling are only going to the approved, authorized individuals is absolutely essential. How did WeCard get started, by the way? Well, back up 21 years, <clears throat> that's when it was it was founded. Um, uh, retailers, particularly NAX, was instrumental. Um, the other trade associations representing the retail community, wholesalers, manufacturers, they came together and they looked at and wanted to address youth access to tobacco, particularly the commercial face-to-face transactions to make sure it didn't happen there, that kids were spotted, identified, and denied an underage sale. And one of the, the, the metrics that is, I think, most astonishing in looking at convenience stores and carding is they do on a regular basis, on a daily basis, they check twice as many plus, uh, two times plus many IDs as TSA does every day. And TSA, that, that's a significant job with, with a lot of challenges. But convenience stores do twice as many age verification, face-to-face age verifications every day. And these are not, this is only including those that, that should be carded. This is not saying those 50 year olds or something like that. The, these are folks that when they say those numbers, uh, if, you, if, if you look under 30, we're going to card you. And it, it's phenomenal, the depth of this program and number of people it, it touches on a daily basis and, and the positive elements that it has in communities. You know, it was really a vision of the retail community and, and the WeCard card <clears throat> prominence and its and retailers adoption of it and and the carding every single day as, as you mentioned it's really a product of retailers who have embraced it and so the iconic brand it's it's uh, placement of stickers in every window and the actual carding it's really because retailers have stepped up and they've stepped up on behalf of their community because they know that they are reflective positively or negatively locally okay so assume I'm a cynical listener I'm sitting here listening, okay, so there's a coalition out there in an industry that says we need to verify the age of people buying tobacco. Okay, tell people to card them. There's more to it though, right? So what what kind of things does WeCard do to actually prepare a retailer to be systematic about verifying age? It's not as simple as telling your, your clerk, check IDs. And in fact, years ago, that was the attitude and the, and the, the current thought. If they just ask for ID, if they just card, problem solved. Well, there's approximately 250 types of IDs. Each state has an average of about 12, from military IDs to the commercial, to the motorcycle, to the underage driver's license. Um, If you can think of your own ID right now, do you know exactly where that date of birth is on that ID versus the Massachusetts ID that 
that's a different state for you. Uh, it's complicated. While you're tr tr trying to provide convenient, fast service in a convenience store, and you may have several people in line, you need to pause, you need to examine it, you need to check that um, back of the ID to make sure it's not a fake. Um, there's a variety of techniques, hold, sweep, flip, that we have them do to make sure it's not a laminated ID that, you know, the old ones that people would make, uh, fake that you have to check the uh, expiration dates, and you have to do the math, as they say, and that's where WeCard comes in to help the frontline cashier avoid having to do the math on the spot in a split second. And so we have a variety of tools. We call them age calculation tools to assist. And you may have seen those. They, they're almost like a countdown <clears throat> clock where it says uh, you can't buy it if you were born after this date. And, and those are very effective. And, and the other thing is uh, when I was younger, you'd see people, it's like, oh, I'm going to go use a, like a Hawaii ID because nobody knows what a Hawaii ID looks like in New York State. But you also have tools so that the, the clerk can say, hey, um, I know what a Hawaii ID looks like, and that's not a Hawaii ID. That's right. There's also a variety of, let's call it gray areas, where until you're actually presented with it, you're not quite sure what's the policy internally, perhaps at the company, or what is the state law? Am I allowed as a uh, to purchase for my father who's waiting outside, and I even have a note and I'm underage, <laughs> th those are the things that the cashiers are presented with. Um, I forgot my ID, you've seen me in the store every single day. That used to be okay if the, the cashier knows the person to be of age. In other words, had previously carded them. Nowadays, with the FDA regulation, they have to be carded each and every time. And yeah, so th like things that. have changed now that the government, the federal government's gotten involved in the retail sale of tobacco, right? Yes. Yeah. They came in, uh, enforcement started in 2010. So this is the seventh year of uh, compliance inspections at the store level. And it's it's gone beyond uh, the idea of retailers being good citizens in their community to a real incentive to continue to do these responsible practices because there can be significant fines and, and it can impact your business if if you do something that doesn't feel in line or isn't in line with what these regulations are. Can you talk to some of the, some of the requirements now that, that retailers must adhere to or they face these various penalties? Sure, I mean, the costs are, are steep when you look just at the, the financial penalty at the state level, and that varies by state. Some are significant, some are, are, are less so. With the addition of the, the federal uh, uh, governance and fines and penalties, they can be very steep. They go from $500 on up to $10,000 to a complete no sale order, which essentially removes your store's right to, to be able to sell for a period of time. That can impact your bottom line. And it used to be a little easier. Everybody, uh, the, the, the tobacco, the age to purchase tobacco used to be 18 in every state. And then four states uh, moved to 19. I believe it's uh, Utah, Alabama, Alaska, New Jersey. Correct. And now you have one that is uh, 21. That's Hawaii. And, and California is joining them. New York City has joined. There are a number of other towns and municipalities. So how... How do you manage all of these different regulations and communicate those effectively to both customers and to retailers? It, and it is complicated. And, and one of the, the vacuums that WeCard fills, and, and I think we do it well because that's the feedback from the retail community, is that we boil down the complexity into something that not only the, the frontline cashier and manager can understand, but that corporate can digest and push down from a, a responsible management standpoint. Um, we boil it down into everything from tip sheets to laminated cards to, to policy papers for uh, stores to, to issue. I think <clears throat> there's another element that complicates things. In the last several years, we've seen alternative tobacco products, alternative uh, nicotine delivery products, however you want to define them, that some have some restrictions, some don't. How are you guys dealing with the introduction of these new products that may appear in convenience stores and may put, present a whole new dynamic to the clerk? The uh, back up a handful of years, there, there really were less than 10 states that regulated those products. And each year they've migrated more and more. Now it's the majority of the states 
have laws and penalties and re- requirements of retailers to identify and prevent those sales. The federal government has now stepped in, and there's regulations now expanding that uh, to cover those products. Uh, each state has a different set of what they identify as restricted products. Um, some rather make it rather broadly. They sort of broadly describe it under the sun. Others have a long seven-paragraph listing of exactly what is restricted. Hmm. And, and the other thing is uh, compliance rates have dramatically changed over the, the past, well, 21 years, I guess, uh, from the start of Week Hard, where – it, it was a different climate, as you were saying earlier, where it was a little bit more, I don't want to say trust-based, but, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll work with you if, uh, you know, it, it looks like it's a legal situation to something like it must be a legal situation. How have the compliance rates changed when, when I, various groups have um, what, what, you call, what we call sting operations, where they come inside stores, they test for compliance rates, how have those rates evolved, and, and where are they today? Yeah. Uh, 20 years ago, it was approximately four or five out of ten sales uh, attempts by miners were, were made. Uh, today, it's dropped significantly down to almost less than one out of ten. So it's significant 90-plus percent compliance. Are we seeing that translate into a reduction in the incidence of smoking among teens? And we talk about compliance, we talk about verification. Is there, are there statistics that are showing that teen smoking is declining over the years? Now, over the years, the government has issued statistics that, yes, uh, use and smoking has declined. Access uh, at retail has, has been uh, reduced significantly. But, the, you know, to answer the question, do kids still have access to it? Yes, but it's predominantly no longer at retail. And I, think, the- I think that's a key element, Jeff, when we talk about the role of convenience stores in communities. And as uh, <clears throat> we were talking earlier, the training of clerks is important. I wonder to what extent the uh, decal on the door of a week card program in place at a store is a deterrent to minor attempts to buy tobacco products because that could be a great message to the community. I think you've done a lot of surveys of what communities think about convenience stores. I don't remember what the stats were about their perception of the sale of tobacco products at convenience stores, but I would think anything we do to put forth saying we are making sure that we do everything we can to keep your kids from buying tobacco with this product would have a strong message to the community. Yeah, I see it as one of those things. You see a wee card sign is on the door. It's basically, hey, don't try here, kids, because you'll be doing that walk of shame. And you may lose your fake ID along the way, and, and it, it's not worth it to even try. It, you know, when we uh, – and there is a, a strong deterrent effect, and, it, and it's increased it, with a variety of different of week cards items. Our calendar, which shows the year with which an ID must show before someone is <clears throat> actually of age. Um, uh, when we were developing and revising it, we would – focus group test it in classroom training sessions of managers and store employees. And we asked them, why do they like the, the week card calendar? And they said, well, we not only use it as an age calculation tool, but we like to face it so that it's the customer can see it. Because when there's an irritation, ups, upset customer, when someone is upset that they've been carded or even denied, they're able to point to it and indicate that this is the law, and this is why this is our policy, and then they're using it not only as a deterrent, but as a way to, to have a little bit better customer service. Yeah, I saw one place uh, they had they had a challenge with a uh, underage sale, and it led to, to significant uh, reduction of their their other sales. It happened to be with beer, and so he jokingly put a sign that said. If you look under 110 years old, we will card you. And that pretty much covered everybody. I, I think the, the oldest person right now is 116. Yep. But that, that, that got most of the people. And I think we just need to stress that there's nothing good that happens at the retail level when there's an underage sale. Retailers don't want them. Um, it doesn't do their business any good. And we, we get these conversations all the time, we, hearing from reporters. Uh, somebody will say, well, I, uh, this, this uh, student group just 
looked at stores and they're working on a project and they they decided that the layout of convenience stores is conducive to encouraging kids to buy cigarettes because if you look at it the cigarettes are near the items that that kids want which is candy snacks things like that well it's a convenience store convenience stores are small everything's near everyone first of all Mm -hmm. every all the products are next to each other but the (coughs) the candy that kids like is the candy that adults like. That's why it's at the counter. It's an impulse item. The tobacco is behind the counter, not because it's an impulse item, because it's required by law to be that way. And when when you look at convenience stores, they're not set up for somebody to walk in and say, you know, today's the day I'm going to start smoking. The idea of advertising, the idea of any of those things related to tobacco inside the store is to tell smokers you have their brand because they're incredibly um, brand sensitive. If you don't have their brand, they aren't going to change brands. They're going to change retailers. So the key thing is to tell smokers you have their product, not to tell non-smokers this is the day you're going to take up smoking. And I think We Card is part of that broader um, set for retailers to to simply say, this is how we do business, this is what we believe in. And when you see that on the doors right away, I think most people in the community should say, this is a good member in standing of our community. You know, the uh, while we talked about the iconic decal that's uh, it's everywhere, it, that's really only one third of what WeCard offers to retailers. When they call us and order materials, we're shipping them two-thirds more training and education materials that are often underneath the counter or in the back room or in a training room, and, and that's out of sight of the general customer. And so the, while the sticker is the most visible, the, the, the thing that's under the radar but that retailers know, it's the training and the education effort to prepare their people to be confident to spot and deny that sale. And I think that's key. I think the... The goal is responsible retailing, but the issue of regulatory compliance is critical, and we're not done regulating this industry. There's a few things coming down the pike, right, that we need to be aware of. Can you kind of walk us through some of the new things that we may be having to deal with at the retail side? Sure. Uh, This summer, August 8th, in fact, um, FDA regulations um, that are, uh, they currently regulate a handful of products, cigarettes, cigarette tobacco, smokeless tobacco, and roll your own tobacco an additional set of products that are often regulated already at the state level, but now the federal government is going to inspect uh, using miners to attempt to purchase them um, and other regulations. Governing e-cigarettes, vaping products and the attachments, cigars, hookah, and a a variety of others, and, and that needs to be on everybody's radar because the same rules, the same carding of under 27 years old, Customers spotting, spotting and denying the sales; those all fall on retailers' shoulders, and and thankfully the retail community has embraced it for these twenty years, and I think they'll make that transition tomorrow. And as part of uh, WeCard, uh, you had talked about the, um, the 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 way that retailers are, are clerks; those on the front line are, are trained is to look, flip, and check. I I, I believe it was. Are there future technologies that are coming in play or that you recommend that might change uh, the job and make it a little easier um, to to make sure that sale is a valid sale? And there, there are a variety of, of old school and new school and new things sort of being tested. You know, there's a lot of mobile smartphone possibilities, um, uh, scanning of IDs. Um, There's a variety of equipment providers, uh, built-in cash register, uh, scanning and age prompt devices that are currently in the marketplace. Uh, We think those will will migrate to uh, faster, um, uh, uh, easier for the cashier so that he can not only do it more accurately, but at a faster pace. And as convenience stores uh, have significantly improved their uh, their compliance rate, how are kids getting tobacco now? Are you hearing other ways that they're getting it in other ways that that um, 
we don't want to necessarily point fingers towards other other possibilities, but what can people do to, to further uh, make sure that, that tobacco doesn't get in the hands of those who aren't of legal age to use it? There's two main main avenues, let's let's call them. One is is a commercial access, uh, and that's what WeCard and the retail community has addressed uh, these past 20 years and is committed to, to continuing. Um, then there's what's called a social access, and that includes an adult buying for a minor and giving it to them, uh, youth bumming cigarettes, uh, s- a certain percentage of stealing, um, and some other kind of gifting or non-commercial way. Uh, for the past 10 years, uh, studies have started to surface, and most recently mentioned by the FDA and, and some of the others, uh, that social access is by far in a way, the, the largest percentage of how kids are obtaining it. And as you look at that, is is there anything that can be done to, uh, or maybe that's too strong a word, but is there a role to see how we can reduce that if that is emerging as a bigger threat? And I'm not saying as we card, but as a society. Um, right now, we card addresses a, a sliver of it. Uh, through uh, because there are some state laws where if a cashier knows that an adult is buying on behalf of a minor, it's 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 violation for that cashier to sell it, knowing full well that it's it's leaving the adult's hands and going to a minor. <clears throat> that scenario of the parking lot exchanging of cash, some states actually allow that currently. And we card is taught, always taught, you know, the right thing to do is to, is to prevent that sale. But again, that's just a, a, a sliver of the total sort of social source aspect of it. Well, I think the uh, issue of minor access to tobacco is a big one. I don't think it's going away anytime soon. I think the uh, combination of WeCard and the commitment retail community has done a great thing. It's actually really had an impact on the community. There's a lot more to be done, and I look forward to seeing the next 21 years of the Week Hard organization really kind of take this on uh, full force and help the communities get this under control so that we can have uh, healthy, vibrant communities and our children are uh, uh, protected from making decisions that are not quite appropriate for their age, age group to make. Doug, real quick, shout out the uh, website so they can learn more. <clears throat> We've got your resources, and it's at weekhard.org. Thank you, Doug, and thank you all for enjoying Convenience Matters. We can talk about an awful lot of things, and, and the best the best topics are the topics that you want, so so tell us about it. Go to naxonline.com slash podcasts, find the information there about shoot us a note, and we'd love to hear from you. You've been listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. For more information about the National Association of Convenience Stores, go to nacsonline.com.